The position of Hand of the King might just be the most iconic title from A Song of Ice and Fire. The story of Book 1 centers around one Hand of the King, Eddard Stark, and the story of the second book centers around another Hand of the King, Tyrion Lannister. The responsibility and power that come with this office shape the story of both these two individuals, as well as the people around them and really the entire realm as a whole. Today we'll cover the Office of Hand of the King, the duties and capabilities that come with that position, and a number of notable hands from throughout history, and what made them good, bad, or something in between. At any given time, the Hand of the King is either the first or the second most powerful person in Westeros. They have a wide array of duties, such as drafting laws, commanding the Crown's armies, and generally overseeing the everyday ruling of the kingdom, as well as its upkeep. Oftentimes, kings do not wish to partake in the less glamorous, more administrative duties that come with running the Seven Kingdoms, and oftentimes it is the Hand who shoulders those responsibilities. Robert Baratheon, for example, only attended three small council meetings in the 20 years that he reigned. In the king's absence, the Hand is the head of the small council. What's more, the Hand is the only person other than the king who is permitted to sit the Iron Throne and rule. We see Ned Stark sit the throne and rule in A Game of Thrones, and Tywin Lannister does the same in A Storm of Swords. Tying into Tywin's other duties, the Hand can also act as a regent for a young king, as Tywin does for Joffrey's. There's another uh, example of that later in this video with another good Hand of the King. Whoever holds this position lives in a tower of their own at the Red Keep, aptly named the Tower of the Hand, at least until stable genius Cersei Lannister burns it in A Feast for Crows. In recent history, the position has been displayed via a chain made from interlocking metallic hands. In House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones, this chain was replaced by a pin that seems to be pretty ubiquitous throughout the 170-year uh, time jump between House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones. Pins such as this were used by certain individuals throughout history, most notably Bloodraven and Oris Baratheon, Oris Baratheon being the first ever Hand of the King. However, they were not nearly as widespread as in the show, where we see everyone across the world essentially using the same pin. With the Hand's responsibilities and symbols covered, only one crucial question remains. What makes a good Hand of the King? In order to answer this, eight historical examples will be presented for you. Some good, some bad, some in between. If there's another hand that you think is worth talking about, be sure to bring it up in the comments below. There were a few more who just missed the cut for this video, and I'd love to hear your opinion on those as well, because there are a ton of them that are super interesting throughout the history of Westeros. We'll start off with two examples from House of the Dragon. I don't typically use examples from the shows for book videos, but so far House of the Dragon seems to be more in line with book canon than it does with show canon. What's more, all of the information within Fire and Blood is questionably sourced, and having something definitive like the HBO series is quite nice. That being said, Lionel Strong proved himself to be a fantastic advisor throughout the first six episodes of House of the Dragon. In the book, he's characterized as someone who's often underestimated, perceived as burly and slow, but being anything but. Lord Strong forged several links of a maester's chain in Old Town, and subsequently served King Viserys as Master of Laws. After acting as Master of Laws for a good amount of time, Lionel Strong is promoted to Hand of the King after Otto Hightower is dismissed from this office. He holds that office for about a decade, most of which time is depicted off-screen in House of the Dragon with the time jump between episodes 5 and 6. During that time, the realm continues to enjoy Viserys' peaceful reign. Lionel does his best to speak and work on behalf of the increasingly frail king. Strong aids in arranging Rhaenyra's marriage to Laenor and encourages reconciliation to heal the rift that is growing between those who support the queen and those who support the princess. He even attempts to, to resign due to his son Harwin's relationship with Rhaenyra, proving his consistent sense of honor and duty. Unfortunately, he is soon killed by his other son, who is not Harwin, in a fire, so he does not get to serve as Hand for very much longer after this attempted resignation. The other example presented in House of the Dragon is quite a bad hand, that being Otto Hightower. Otto served Jaehaerys, Viserys, and Aegon II, and for the most part his time and power was peaceful. That being said, Otto contributed more to the growing rift between the branches of the Targaryen family than perhaps any other individual person. First, he suggested that, that Rhaenyra should be an heir to Viserys in order to undermine Daemon, and then he manipulates the king into marrying his daughter and subsequently advances his grandson Aegon's position as heir so fervently that it gets him dismissed as hand for a decade. All of this scheming directly leads to the conflict later called the Dance of the Dragons. While he served primarily during peacetime, Otto Hightower's handship was defined by his role in starting one of the most bloody conflicts in Westerosi history. Moving into a more modern example, we have Lord Tywin Lannister. He served under the last Targaryen king, Aerys II. 
Taiwan was an incredibly efficient legislator and had an excellent strategic mind. He was also exceptionally ruthless, proving his brutality by stamping out the Rain Tarback Rebellion shortly after being named as Han. Taiwan served as Ares' Han for a decade, during which time the realm prospered. However, this prosperity did not last, as is apparent by the story. Uh, the relationship between Ares and Taiwan began to break down in 268 AC after a tourney in King's Landing where Ares made some distasteful comments about Taiwan's wife. At that point, Ares began deliberately ignoring Taiwan's counsel. The realm began to suffer as a result of Ares' erratic decision-making, and eventually Taiwan resigned his hand in the year 281 AC after his son Jamie was named to the King's Guard. Naming Jamie to the Sacred Order made him Ares' hostage and ensured Taiwan's family line was now in jeopardy, seeing as his four firstborn son could no longer inherit any of his lands or possessions. This led to Tywin's resignation as Hand and his subsequent pretty much non-involvement until the, in the War of Robert's Rebellion until its very end. Later in the main series, Tywin becomes Hand again, this time to very different kings in very different circumstances. Tywin serves as Hand to both of his grandsons, those being Tommen and Joffrey, essentially ruling the realm in their stead almost as a regent. Despite the fact that he effectively leads the crown through the War of the Five Kings, I believe that Tywin was quite a bad hand during his second tenure. While he did win the war, he did so in a manner that created a lot of enemies. There's pretty much no way to spin the Red Wedding in a positive PR direction for the Lannisters. Tywin likely views this as good, as he typically uses fear to rule, but too much fear is a bad thing. I think that's Machiavelli said similar things. It's better to be feared and loved in equal measure than one in full measure. Uh, too much fear leads to one's enemies rising up against them. The Lannisters are quite strong throughout A Storm of Swords, however their power drastically decreases as soon as Tywin is killed. Cersei and Jaime are not capable of maintaining their father's legacy, and Cersei's decision-making throughout Feast leads to a massive decrease in power for both her personally and her entire house, and even that crown, debatably. Tywin was a man obsessed with his legacy and family. Both of, both of these things ended up falling apart rapidly after his demise, largely due to his own brutal methods. Both this tenure and his tenure under Ares leads Tywin to being a very interesting case of a Hand of the King. He did very well under Ares, but his time under Joffrey and Tommen is more defined than its falling out in its aftermath than anything else. Jumping back in time a little bit, there are two more examples of good Hands of the King that come from the time of one of the most widely celebrated rulers in Westerosi history, that being Jaehaerys I. Both of these Hands sort of played the game on easy mode, seeing as how good Jaehaerys was as a king, but their accomplishments and achievements are very important to the story and to Jaehaerys' rule as a whole, nevertheless. So they're important to look at as candidates for being good hands of the king. The first of these hands was one Rogar Baratheon. While Rogar did come into conflict with Jaehaerys near the end of his tenure as hand, and that had a few kind of evil stepdad vibes within that conflict, as Rogar was Jaehaerys' stepdad, uh, Rogar proved himself a very capable advisor to the young king during his regency. He encouraged forgiveness for the houses that had sided with Magor, and this tendency towards peace and forgiveness seems to have become a trend from that point forward in Jaehaerys' reign and life as a whole. Jaehaerys even chose to show mercy when Rogar himself nearly rose in rebellion against his king, and the two remained allies throughout the remainder of Rogar's life. Jaehaerys' second hand worth mentioning is Septon Barth. Born the son of a common blacksmith, Barth worked his way up by tending to the libraries of the Red Keep. From there, he officiated Jaehaerys' wedding and aided the young king in drafting a doctrine of exceptionalism, which did a great part in setting the kings and Targaryens as a whole apart from the common people and shaped the crown's relationship with the Faith of the Seven for centuries to come. He worked with the council to form a code of laws for which Jaehaerys would later become famous. What's more, he supported good Queen Alysanne in many of her endeavors, most notably ending the right to a first knight. Barth's contributions were likely vital in this pursuit, as Jaehaerys had a very strong tendency to dismiss the suggestions and wishes of women in his family both before and after this point in history. It's also good to note that Barth inadvertently saved the entirety of King's Landing from death by fireworms. And I'm not talking dragons as fireworms, I'm talking literal worms that have fire inside of them and would be inside of people. When Arya Targaryen returned to the city from her journeys abroad, likely to Valyria on the back of Balerion the Black Dread, she was quite ill. Barth examined her, eventually placing her in an ice bath. This killed Arya instantly. And these weird little fireworm guys burst out of her skin and were generally horrifying and disgusting. They seemed to be 
at the very least, a partial cause of the doom and be something that originated in Valyria that potentially is what allows no people to currently live there. Luckily, the bath and the ice killed these worms instantly in addition to their hosts. If this were not the case, the city might have been doomed, and Barth can be thanked for the city not falling into ruin for this, so good on Barth, gold star. These last two examples are widely considered some of the best Hands of the King that Westeros has ever seen, each for different reasons and due to a variety of accomplishments. I go back and forth on which one I think was better overall from an objective standpoint, though speaking subjectively, there is one that I much prefer over the other. Brynden Rivers, or Blood Raven, was the bastard son of King Aegon IV Targaryen. He ascended to the position of Hand of the King and Master of Whispers under the rule of his great nephew, Aerys I Targaryen. Blood Raven was the true power behind the crown, not Aerys. It was said that he had a thousand eyes in one, due to his network of spies and his own singular eye. Many rumors abounded regarding his magical capabilities, and based on what we see in the main series and in Tales of Duncan Egg, these tales seem to be true. He seems to have the ability to change his face at will with glamour, similarly to how Melisandre does, in addition to having the powers of a green seer and warg. This makes sense given his heritage is of the Blackwoods, which have very strong first men blood in them. Uh, additionally, Bloodraven served his hand for 24 years, during which time he was feared throughout all seven kingdoms. This period was largely defined by the Blackfire Rebellions, and Brynden played a key role in quashing the first, second, and third wars in this series of revolutions. In many ways, Bloodraven's time as hand quite resembles Tywin's time in the same position. Both men ruled through fear and took extreme measures to stamp out any sort of rebellion against the crown. Similarly to Tywin, there came a day where Bloodraven had to answer for all of his actions. In 238 AC, a great council was convened in order to select a new king after the death of King Aerys I. One potential candidate who stepped forward was a Blackfire, and Brynden Rivers swore up and down that the council would provide this claimant safety and hear out his claim in good faith. Bloodraven lied and killed the Blackfire, and thereby was banished by the new king, Aegon V, for his actions. Brynden Rivers was sent to the Night's Watch, where he eventually served as Lord Commander, and then vanished beyond the Wall, assumedly becoming the three-eyed crow that Bran interacts with in the main story. Bloodraven's time as Hand pretty much perfectly embodies the Dungeons & Dragons alignment of lawful evil, as he's willing to go to any means necessary to preserve the current rule of law. So it's very much an interesting handship, as he was someone who was very evil, but he was a power behind the crown in a time when the crown really didn't have any concrete pa power. By this point, the dragons had died out completely, and really the only thing holding the realm together was the idea that the Targaryens were exceptional, crafted by Septon Barth all those years ago. Last but certainly not least, I get a well-earned chance to show my bias. In my objectively correct opinion, the best Targaryen king also holds the title for best hand of the king. Viserys II Targaryen was an incredibly effective administrator, and it's said that he ruled while his brother Aegon brooded and while his nephews Daeron and Baelor warred and prayed respectively. While Aegon was quite an effective king at times, he was often distracted by his incredibly justified depression. During these times, Viserys ruled in his stead. Both of Aegon's sons were consumed by either war or the faith, and the task of rebuilding the realm from its most destructive war ever fell to Viserys, and all of this was done without the aid of dragons, for perhaps the first time in Targaryen history. I've got an entire dedica video dedicated to Viserys II on this channel, which I highly advise you check out if you want to hear more of my thoughts and opinions on Viserys II, and what makes him such a great Hand of the King, and King in general. Overall, the main concern that people have brought up with that video was the fact that he did allow his son, Aegon IV, to become king, and it made him marry his daughter. But overall, I would put Aegon IV's faults more on Aegon himself than on Viserys, especially given the fact that Viserys was running the realm for about 40 years before uh, Aegon came along and ruined everything and started all of the Blackfire rebellions. But overall, Viserys II, in my eyes, is pretty handily the best Hand of the King. No pun intended. I did not script that joke. So what makes a good Hand of the King? Lionel Strong shows us the importance of honor. Tywin Lannister shows us the necessity of strength. Rogar shows that a Hand should be a mentor, while Barth emphasizes the importance of wisdom and the King's policies. Brynden Rivers displayed the importance of knowledge and of ruthlessness, and Viserys II possessed all of these traits in addition to a dedication to balancing the needs of the dynasty with those of the small folk. 
All of these qualities are absolutely vital in a good hand of the king, and the absence of one or more of them often leads to the downfall of the hand or even of the entire king's rule in certain cases. So, this has been my video on Hands of the King. What do you think? Who do you think are the best hands? I've ranked them on the screen in my opinion as to who the best to worst hands were of the ones I mentioned in this video. Though, like I said, there are a lot of them that aren't mentioned in this video. If you enjoyed this, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, all that stuff. It really helps me grow the channel. And I always really appreciate it. It really makes me feel good to see the channel grow. And I'm still really not sure why you guys are here listening to me talk generally. But it's nice to be able to talk about something I've been so passionate about for the past seven years now at this point. Which is a, a super long time now that I'm thinking about it. So yeah, more videos coming in the near future. And yeah, I hope you all will stay tuned for those. And I hope you all have a nice day. I'll see you soon.